Just to give you a bit of a heads up, I'm going to do a little bit of sort of theoretical exploration and then move into some practical examples. So if I'm boring you to tears, um, please hang on. In 1999, philosopher Edgar Morin wrote, education is the force for the future because it is one of the most powerful instruments of change. One of the greatest problems we face is how to adjust our way of thinking to meet the challenge of an increasingly complex, rapidly changing, unpredictable world. And he's using the, that word complex in the technical sense, um, in the context of complexity theory. So in this paper, I want to look at the complexity of our classrooms, specifically the unpredictable, changing, ongoing phenomenon known as emergence, and how we can support this in our teaching today and in the future. So complexity theory gives us a way into um, understanding this ongoing change. It is the study of complex systems. And I've got some examples of systems there on the screen. Complexity theory is a framework that recognizes the way interactions create and sustain open dynamic systems. The most important acknowledgement of complexity theory is that complex systems are generated and sustained by their interactions, by the way those parts interact. So it's a complete shift away from looking at systems as organized and controlled by a leader figure. So because of this, complexity theory is useful for understanding biological and social systems and also educational systems. When taking a complexivist look at Shakespeare education, whether from a distant look at the way the Australian curriculum operates um, or narrowing into the specific behaviour of a student or a teacher, we're always interested less in the individual agents or parts of a system and more interested in the interactions between them. So complexity is about looking for points of connection, disruption, flow, or tension. Identifying that classrooms, schools, and universities are complex is not a novel thing. There is a growing body of literature on this subject, and anyone new to complexity will quickly realize how many complexivist tenets actually sound really familiar already or kind of just like common sense. Ellie Govers makes this point quite clearly when she tells us that Education is complex. Many educators would agree that it's influenced by many, often contradictory, voices and power structures. If education is complex, and again, using that term in its technical sense, then complexity theory is of value to understanding its processes. As Deborah Osberg and Gert Biesta tell us, many educationalists have found complexity theory helpful for describing, characterizing and understanding the dynamics of education differently. One of the main reasons for this is that it allows us to see the unpredictable, generative character of educational processes and practices in a positive light. This is important. Complexity theory values this unpredictability, as Lewis mentioned before. And that makes complexity theory valuable in an unpredictable world, as we saw in the opening quote from Edgar Morin. But, and you may have already jumped ahead uh, to bring up what I'm about to say here, there's a couple of problems with this. First, our instinct is often to value certainty over uncertainty in many areas of life, but also when it comes to knowledge and learning. Second, while we may all know that learning is dynamic, the structures in which we teach and learn are less so. Education is a highly regulated, organized, structured system. Or, to put it in Osberg and Biesta's terms, despite the comp complex, recursive and nonlinear nature of educational processes and practices, there is a substantial amount of order and regularity in education. So how do we account for this? Osberg and Biesta argue that educational systems actually reduce their own complexity in order to enhance that order and regularity, so to enable greater control over the system. The importance of control in educational systems raises the question of where power lies. I was actually really interested that you mentioned this question of powerful knowledge and power, so I think that might resonate in interesting ways. So I mentioned before that a complex system does not have a single leader who holds power, but it does have controlling and dominant behavioral patterns. Govers writes that these prevailing power structures in a complex system lock in new constituents and steer them in a particular direction. And I think it's very easy to apply that quote to our students. These behavioral patterns, or if you're wanting the complexity of this technical term, you would use attractors, but we don't really need that jargon. 
These patterns are not about individual or organisational control, but rather they're about the strength of a system's behaviours, the direction a system is most likely to go in. So to have some control over this direction, you need to reduce the system's complexity. Complexity reduction ensures that connections between actions and consequences are more predictable and thus more controllable. This is why, in Diesta's words, complexity reduction is actually about the exertion of power. So educational systems may limit their complexity in order to increase their predictability and thus how much we can control them. And to some extent, we need this. Any system, including educational systems, needs some kind of stabilizing force to ensure cohesion and strength. But too much of this is unhealthy. Of course, it needs to be balanced with diversity. That enables a system to be more robust, more innovative, and more adaptive. So I want to take a simple example from one of Shakespeare's plays, and that's A Midsummer Night's Dream. In the opening scene, Shakespeare presents us with an over-regulated Athenian system, which is built on what Aegeus calls the ancient privilege of Athens, which is what gives him the means to dispose of his daughter uh, in the way that he sees fit. Hermia struggles against the limitations of her social system. It's overly constrained. The complexity has been reduced to a point that those within it struggle, and the future of the system's vitality is question questionable, which I think you see from the fact that the young want to leave it. Now, we see Hermia's resistance to Athens' dominant power structures, structures which are no longer working effectively because of their excessive rigidity, in her appeal to Theseus. And in the interest of time, I'll just let you read that while I continue on. Hermia requests here to understand the full limits of the systems in which she is embedded, and she articulates her resistance as an unknown power, emboldening her. So that's this word coming back again. However, as we all know, fleeing to the other extreme, the chaotic otherness of the forest, isn't exactly sustainable either, lacking what Athens has in abundance, organization. So a middle ground between the over-regulated Athens and the chaotic forest is optimal for long-term system survival. So it's a bit of a simplistic metaphor, but I think you can see where I'm going um, <laughs> applying this to complex systems. And I also hope that the way these systems work sounds familiar to you. Uh, it's good to keep in mind complexity theory isn't a silver bullet. It doesn't have all the answers, but it does help us to articulate the way our societies and systems work. So now I'd rather not linger further on how our educational systems are complex, but instead I want to think about the so what of this, the implications for Shakespeare education in the classroom. What follows once we recognise that our educational systems are in fact complex? What does this perspective suggest to us about the future of education? So this example has shown us that complex systems ideally have a kind of balance between dominant, the dominant structure and behavioural patterns of the system and more diverse counteractive behaviours. That's a healthy system. But we haven't covered how those behaviours emerge. And that's through a word I used earlier, what complexity theorists call emergence. This is how systems sustain themselves, develop, and survive. Emergence is, in other words, the future of Shakespeare education. So what do I mean by it? So emergence refers quite simply to what is created by, what emerges from, interactions between parts of a system. So in a classroom, it's never solely the teacher or the student or the text or the space or the computer or the tech. It's the interactions between all those things. And like I said, that's, that's pretty common sense for us. But this interaction, of course, doesn't always produce what we expect. As complexivist John Uri points out, components of a system through their interactions spontaneously develop collective properties or patterns. This element of complexity is, at its most basic, a reminder that the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Emergence can't be reduced to a system's individual components because it's generated by those self-organizing interactions. And it's that process which enables a system to produce new phenomena. So, while the aim of educational systems is to provide predetermined, clear, predictable outcomes, that is not always what happens at any level of the system you choose to look at. In his chapter on complexity in Australian education, Noel Goff writes, the concept of emergence suggests that what we have previously imagined to be outputs or products, knowledge, understandings, individual subjectivities, etc., emerge in and through educational processes in unique and unpredictable ways. Emergence is thus at its heart always unpredictable and sometimes unexpected. Goff adds that the language of complexity theorizing encourages us to see education as a work that anticipates and even welcomes unpredictable change and evolution. Now that sounds really nice in theory, but how does one welcome unpredictable change in your classroom? What does this look like in a school or a university or a classroom context? 
I think complexity theory is very good at considering this theoretically, but perhaps not so helpful practically. I want to finish up today by sharing two examples of how I have attempted or am attempting to welcome a little bit of complexity into my teaching and learning experiences in the classroom. Both of these activities may already be very familiar to you, and that wouldn't be surprising. As I've said earlier, our classrooms, our education systems are already complex, so it's just about how you engage with that. So, one way that we can attempt to shift the amount of complexity in our systems is through assessment. Biesta argues that perhaps the most important way in which complexity is reduced within formal education is through assessment. And the reason for this is pretty clear. When it comes to learning outcomes and results, clarity and certainty are kind of desirable outcomes. But from a complexitous perspective, you need to get comfortable with ambiguity. So within the English department at my university, James Cook, we're about to pilot the implementation of an adapted version of the UNESSAY, which some of you I'm sure have heard of. Not our original concept, um, concept of course, adapted here from Ryan Cordell's UNESSAY model. So this is an unstructured, creative, open assessment with very few rules, as you can see on the screen. Now, we've gone with a modified version. I was a little bit wary, and it's probably very reductive of me, I was wary of incorporating something called an unessay in a first-year subject, which also needs to teach students about writing an actual essay. Um, so to avoid confusion, we've actually renamed this assessment a digital story. It's a level one English subject. It's low stakes, it's low weighted, it's early assessment. Um, students must respond to a set text and, a narrative, and its narrative structure in any way they choose, but they must share their work digitally. So they could build something, write something, perform something, and so on. So by removing the requirements of a specific form, I'm increasing the complexity of the task. More factors come into play, we open up the possibilities for student assessment. There are still reductive elements at work here. It's weighted, it's assessed, it has a due date, it has a marking rubric, but it is just a little bit more complex than the other assessments in the subject. Now, the second activity for complexifying a classroom is, again, very straightforward. It's the incorporation of metaphor. In their use of complexity theory, uh, thinking to rework education in nursing, so a very different field, Jonas Simpson, Mitchell and Cross experimented with metaphors because they defy boundaries. They reflect the whole, and they are consistent with high-level thinking complexity pedagogy. So I've tried this out in a range of ways with first-year students and in educator workshops. I use this for an only non-assessable informal learning activity so that the outcomes are less predetermined by the system's regulations. So when teaching Wuthering Heights to my first-year students at JCU last year, I asked them to create their own metaphor to describe their experiences of the novel. And this is, these are some of the responses I received. I'll let you read that and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going. When teaching Macbeth, I tried out something slightly different. I tried out a metaphor substitution exercise. Students are introduced to a metaphor from the text and then asked to simply create an alternative metaphor and focus on how that changes the original meaning as they interpret it. What's lost? What's gained? What new elements can we detect? The aim, of course, is to help them understand more clearly what the word or image is doing there. But this is also an activity to enhance rather than reduce complexity because it's inviting in the unexpected, increasing the number of factors related to the meaning in this specific context. It complicates the link between the action, the creation of metaphor, and the consequence, the understanding of the play, the meaning, the learning achieved. So metaphor substitution works to help students focus on getting inside of the world of a metaphor, as Simon Palfrey refers to it. It helps to understand figurative imagery. It's creative, so they enjoy it. The results can be amusing. Um, and it gets them thinking a little bit like Shakespeare. And it gives them ownership of the text. So with my first year students studying Macbeth, um, I asked them to look at a simile for Macbeth, the captain's descri description of Macbeth's fight with the rebel MacDonald. Doubtful it stood, he tells them, as two spent swimmers that do cling together and choke their art. And these are a few of the examples from my students. You can see how there's kind of a weird theme developing around desperation and consumption here. There was no way I could predict these responses and no way that what students gained from inventing them could be predetermined or controlled. This also means that sometimes this exercise will, use, will yield, to use the words of one of my more creative students, futile fruit. But sometimes it might accentuate a student's engagement with an understanding of Shakespeare's language. So while I close, while I close in the last sort of 30 seconds, I'd like to try this out with you all. I'd like you to grab your phone, laptop, device, 
head to slido.com and enter in that code. You don't need anything else, just that. It's anonymous, it's completely anonymous. And I'd like you to come up with your own metaphor for teaching and learning. Use something that's occurred to you over the last two days, let your imaginations run wild. No one will know it's you. And I'll just jump across to it. And please don't leave the screen all sad and empty. <laughs> so while you do that, I'm just going to sum up in the interest of time. So beyond simpler aims of engagement and buy-in to the study of Shakespeare poetry and literature more broadly, the metaphor exercises I've demonstrated increase the unpredictability of connections between text and student. Rather than aligning with prevailing power structures and preferred behavioral patterns or attractors, as I mentioned earlier, um, which as we discussed above, steer people in particular directions, these kinds of activities allow students to choose their own directions. Fumbling around the dark room looking for the light switch and the beauty revealed when you find it. That's wonderful. Thank you. Brave first sharer. So this kind of process brings in the students' own biases, their own experiences, the influences from their past, their context, what they've recently read, how their mind works. That is, it will make the outcome more complex, by which I mean more unpredictable, richer, more chaotic, more diverse. <laughs> It is a small act that aims to recognize and enhance the complexity of our classrooms, but as complexity theory tells us, actions and consequences are not proportionate. So a very small act may have unexpectedly significant ramifications. So this paper has outlined, I hope, how complexity theory understands education, how it can help us, and how it privileges unpredictability and emergence. While I've focused on manifestations of this in the classroom, what you might call a microcosmic scale, imagine the possibilities if we leveled up and applied this macrocosmically, looking at the future of Shakespeare education by the lens of complexity theory. I'm really excited to read these now, so I'm going to stop. Thank you very much. <laughs>